It makes you wonder if, if depression is a feedback mechanism that you're not like you're incongruent with what your life path should be. Because I've been, you know, depressed. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's why I think using antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications and like all like the numbing agents that we have access to, it's like, dude, your body very likely is is having a natural response to an environment that's uh, it's not optimal for its development. And you're getting these signals saying like, we need to change. You know, so the option is like, essentially it's like, you know, smoke is pouring through your house and the, the fire alarm is going off. So the option is like, okay, well, somebody get those damn batteries out of the fire alarm, <laughs> yeah. you know? Right. Or the other one is like, there's somewhere, there's a fire happening. Like we have to figure out where that thing is and start hunting around like, oh my God, okay, when we got, then we got to need to do the work to extinguish the fire. You know, now we need to like restructure the house because a quarter of it burnt down. Hey friends, welcome back. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at blueblocks.com, leaders in blue light filtering glasses. So if you're like me, your life revolves around devices, computers, you work from, on a computer, you use your phone to communicate with your family and connect with the world you really need to protect your eyes. So there's actually some scary research coming out, at least in animal models, showing that just exposing your retinas to and your eyes to LED devices affects neuroexcitotoxicity and can affect brain health and much more. So you can optimize your body's circadian rhythm, sleep-wake cycle, reduce digital eye strain at the end of the day. I know when I was working on books and writing and researching and preparing content for this channel, sometimes before I was wearing on a regular basis my blue light blocking glasses from Blue Blocks, I would have eye strain and I would feel just really like tense at the end of the day. And you can really avoid that. I now have two different pairs of blue blocks. Um, I have the, the computer glasses and then the orange glasses at night, the sleep glasses, which are amazing. And they also make an amazing sleep mask that can really prevent all these different lights from affecting your sleep and your body's circadian rhythms, growth hormone release and all that. So you can support your eye health and your body's circadian rhythms by going to blueblocks.com. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Links are below, and as a listener, check it out. You can save 20% off your next order. Now, today's show with Aaron Alexander. He's an awesome guy, awesome human, really inspirational, very diverse. He has such a, a vast knowledge of information about health and wellness and flexibility, mental health. So we get into a lot of things, but we're starting off this conversation with a cold plunge and a breathing exercise, and then we're going into the sauna, and then we're having a more traditional sit-down podcast. So he has a great book that's out available as you watch this called the align method links are below definitely check it out it's loaded with great information about mobility and after this conversation to be honest it you know not too many conversations totally changed my life but aaron's information about hip mobility and, and how i sit and i've noticed that i'm doing a lot more work sitting down i'm moving my hips in in different directions and i've had a lot less back pain as a result of that so i really want you to, to check out this video and we have chapter markers right below. Thanks Sam for that great idea. So you can you know really kind of fast forward the conversation or move the conversation around to what you'll find helpful. So the breath work is great, the cold plunge, and then we get into the conversation about mindset, about connecting with people, about structuring your exercise so that it can you know optimize social connections instead of just building big biceps because as Aaron will talk about, you know, no matter you know where you are in your lifespan, your biceps will probably shrink over time. So if you put a lot of your identity into any one musculoskeletal group, you can that can lead to disappointment. And so he talks a lot about instead like really shoring up your social connections. So I hope you enjoy the content. If you do, please hit that like button and let's dive back to it with Aaron. So what stacked up sitting position looks like and is, is you've already got it figured out, exactly. Okay. Um, so we want to, as we're doing this, be kind of like the front edge of your sit bones. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, so you're going to reach Keep underneath your more. butt and grab your butt cheeks yeah. and pull them straight back. Okay. So the goal is for us to have them actually going to get another cushion and throw this underneath your butt. So it's not Indian cross style though. You can, whatever okay. whatever works. Yeah. So the, the goal like I could do that. as we're doing this, so this is going to be way better for you, okay. is for your hips to be above your knees. Ah, yeah, yeah. So as you start to create more okay. mobility through adductors and hamstrings and it like start to open up the hips a bit more. So now you're in a really good spot. You could stay yeah. in this position for a really long time. Yeah. My hip, this hip bothers me. So over time it would irritate me, but yeah, I'll do it. I can rock it. Yeah. Great, yeah. Perfect. Um, but the, like a, just a great rule for people in general mm. is hips above knees. 
you can have hips above the knees, then you're going to be putting that pelvis in a position where you can actually stack on that front edge of the sit bones uh -huh. and put the, the sacrum and the lumbar spine and everything in a position where it can be stacked up. Nice. Most people, when they're sitting down, yeah. they kind of have their hips below the knees and they're kind of rolling into this position. If I were to load this system from this position, it'd be really bad. You know, if I put 200 pounds in my spine. Right. But if I'm in the position you're in, I can press down. Yeah. And I can put, so just hang back, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let me just kind of push you around. So from here, don't lean forward. Don't okay. Let, oh, let okay. me just, just chill. Demonstration. Yeah, just chill out. Yeah. So from here, if you could just become a little bit more upright. Yeah, there. Yeah. So now I can load down through your spine. Yeah. And we can put, you know, a buttload of weight, and it actually just feels like a therapeutic massage. Yeah. Whereas if you are collapse, yeah. you're in that position, and I push down, you're just gonna it's not a bad thing. It's just the weight, you have the weight of gravity moving through your spine all day long. Mm -hmm. So you may as well put yourself in a position where you're preparing to be Underloaded. fit and effective. Yeah. So even this position, I mean, for squatting and people that lift, would you say, or? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. It'll yeah. teach you more hip, okay. Yeah, so when you are squatting and you know lifting or doing any form of athletics or whatever it is, um, if you're continually hunched over in this position, you know, so say we were doing, um, you know, judo or something like that, and you're kind of in this collapsed position, I can pull you down and yeah. collapse you. Right. You know, so if sense. you're practicing being in a little bit more of an upright position and stacking through those hips, that same position happens if we're, you know, wrestling or playing football or dance. You'll see that person distributing that weight from their head all the way down to their feet. This is a practice of that, and not to mention it's really helpful with uh, cardiovascular health. Mm, yeah. So eating in this position is a great benefit because it's, uh, you have more blood to be circulating up into your organs to digest food, as opposed to that blood sitting down your lower compartments all the way down to the bottom of the, of the table. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of good reasons for it. That's awesome. That's a great tip. Right. Anyway, so this is awesome. Here right. we go. Let's so, do it. So we're gonna start off and just doing like a, like a basic um, Wim Hof type thing. Okay. So we're gonna start off and we're gonna do 30 big breaths through the mouth. Um, so emphasize a pretty like lateral expansion of the ribs, out through the belly, really big breath. So you're gonna breathe in deep and then just let it come out. And then in deep and then let it come out. And we'll go a little faster than that. Let's do it 30 times. Okay. And then we're gonna blow all the air out. Um, and then we're gonna hold our breath. And then we're gonna hold that for whatever feels a little bit beyond comfort. Um, and so we don't have to be like a hero or anything like that. Just mm -hmm. kind of like you getting into the realm of like, okay, this isn't really comfortable anymore. Right. And then take a normal breath in and then uh, we'll start breathing again. Okay. 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 Cool. I'll follow you. Ready to go? All right. All right.
Are you getting the freezer? Okay. All right, you're up. All right. <laughs> All right. So we'll start starting the timer. All right, let's do it. Here we go. Start in three minutes. Oh, face us. Turn oh. around. <laughs> That's good. You've already started, so you're a good thing. Uh, you want to get all the way in below the neck if you can. I know it's a pain in the ass and terrible experience. I appreciate you being game for it. Focus breath through the nose. Good. You're already 20 seconds in. So it's only going to be hard for the first like minute and a half, and then after that it gets kind of easier. Yeah. Um, good. Beautiful. Bringing that breath into the nose. So you're already quite good with this stuff, which is really convenient. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a free, my, my cold plunge is not nearly this cold. Okay. You know, the uh, in the winter, the, the, the tub does get cold because it's cool in Seattle. Yeah. And I had a, I had a, like a, what you call a coffin freezer like this and I was gonna convert it. Yeah. But it was a little small and I, now I like this because this can be, you can do this all year round. Yep, In you the do summer, it. it's just. You can do it with, um, two people as well. And so oh. what I've done, which sounds a little creepy, but I've done quite a bit getting in with another person, usually a female, yeah. and um, staring each other's eyes the whole time. Ooh, that's so cool. stay in for like, you know, four or five minutes and yeah. just eye contact. Yeah. <laughs> which is like people do that sitting, you know, in a chair at like a therapy group or whatever. Right. It's pretty interesting to compound it with that. And I find with that, um, the coal almost like disappears. Just really strange. That's super cool. Yeah, because you only have so much bandwidth to focus yeah, on. Yeah. So like the brains. When all the bandwidth is on how shitty this situation <laughs> is, you're like, yeah, you're right, it is shitty. Yeah, yeah. But when there's like another situation to sort out, this kind of goes into the back burner. That's interesting. Which is very fascinating. So the premise of getting the neck underneath is that to kind of cool down the brainstem so that it and get all the glands. Ah. Yeah. So you want to so you want to get um, you know the thyroid and all the different mm. parts in there. Um, so just getting as much of you in there as possible. And at the end, what I would recommend doing is uh, getting your whole head in. Okay. So I'll do like a little <laughs> hamstring stretch thing where yeah. I'll essentially just do like a forward fold, bring my whole head in okay. and get all the parts in there. Um, you're familiar with like the, the mammalian dive reflex. Yeah. You know, yeah. So just so you can do that, people can do that at home. It's kind of interesting. You just get like some, uh, an icy bowl of water mm -hmm. and just literally just dunk your face inside there for like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And you can start to activate some of these similar responses that you get from actually doing the cold plunge. Wow. Obviously this is like way more impactful. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you're, you know, say before a meeting or something like that, you're freaking out, you right. want to get a better night's rest. Mm -hmm. um, that can be a really powerful tool. Yeah. I found the cold showers before bed or a game changer. Yep. Yeah, I do them all the time. Yeah. I get in this before bed you just a couple maybe sixty percent of the time. Nice. Sometimes I don't feel like it. Is it shorter before bed? Because you don't want to activate that much, or how long do you do it? It just depends on how I feel. Yeah. At least um, at least two minutes. Mm. That's you. Wow. Cool. So you're gonna dunk if you feel like it, yeah. dunk your face okay. in as much as you don't want to get your hair wet or whatever, do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, but uh, I recommend I'll do the forward your fold your like you said. Do the forward fold, man. Yeah. Yeah. Woof. Very right. good. Well done. Very nice. So I meant forward fold while your body's actually all the way in, but that's okay. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm not that flexible, but. <laughs> so, and then, and then you're next, Mr. Sam. Sam. Mr. Sam? Yep, not off the hook. So when I get in, my kind of goal is to uh, be as calm as possible. So like the initial reaction getting in is a great time to try and pay attention to calm me down as fast as I can. So emphasizing the breath out and trying to just maintain composure. And when I'm in here, I'll put my attention on out breaths. That's activating more of that parasympathetic rest, digest, calm side of the nervous system. And just try to put my energy into the breath, into calming. And then with time, what's ha what happens, it's quite interesting, is you'll start to feel the organs start to warm up and blood will start to pool in and almost has like this interesting tingly sensation in and around your viscera, which is quite fascinating. 
So oftentimes what I'll do is I'll stay in essentially until I feel those tingles. And that'll be a recipe. I'm going to go get into it. Well, so the idea, the ultimate goal would be to get to a point where you have control of the, you know, like the galvanic, galvanic skin response, like you have control of your temperature. And so being calm enough in it that you can kind of like manipulate that. And so what I find with this that, that gets interesting is once you're in it for a while, like over three minutes or four minutes or something like that, um, I feel my body almost starts to become like numb in a way and it almost gets easier. Like right now, like I don't necessarily feel cold. I just feel sensation. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna do my little dunk. Thanks for doing this with me, man. I love it when people are down to do it. Yeah. to carry. It's right around the time that it can carry itself. But yeah, that's been something that's interesting that I've noticed that's it's been a fascinating evolution with in day-to-day -day life, you don't typically we just say shit. You spout words out, and you do out. You have your, your your actions. You do. It's like, but very rarely do we have that opportunity to really check in, and and say like, okay, is this the best that I can do right now? You know. And so with the book, it's this interesting expression where everybody knows like, you probably did your best, right? You know. But more often than not, people hide behind like, oh, I wasn't even really trying. Mm. Oh, I mean, I could have done better. It's like, no, bitch. Like, this is the best I can do. <laughs> <laughs> and right. so I think it was, it was like an interesting thing for me to get to apply that with pride of, okay, when I show up at the grocery store and I, you know, buy groceries and I'm at the register, I want to do the best I can with that regist the, the person, you know, opening the, the, the cash machine. So it had all this transferability to process writing the book in your own life. Yeah, for sure. That's a really good point. Yeah. I mean, you know, like in, you played sports in high school, right? Um, hockey. Yeah, the coaches that. would kind of talk about that, like, this is like our one, we only have three more games or four more games, and then if you're a senior, like, this is your last or second to last game, right? So put out your best effort, but in life, we don't really, you know, unless you are a creative or whatever, there's always like a second chance or people are kind of not engaged. Yeah, you let slip by. And then all yeah. of a sudden, there's, you know, a point where you might wake up and, you know, all of a sudden, like, your skin might be a little bit more wrinkly and there might be some... You know the what do they call them the, the crow's feet on your eyes and you're like oh shit like life's really moved by like what have i have i really like dug in and invest myself in it or did i just kind of like let each day slip by mm. that's and a so, great point a lot of people don't think about that yeah and so i think that if you do you know you you, you add a little to a little after a while you get a lot mm -hmm. you know so if you can start to take that same those same principles of really with pride doing the best that you can not hiding behind oh i didn't i wasn't even really i wasn't even trying right because that's what i've done most of my life i've, I've hid behind oh I, I it wasn't my full effort i could have done better oh like you know I'll, I'll read a poem or something like that i did a poetry workshop recently um and that's just my my default is i go to 
letting everybody know that, oh, I just threw this together and I just pad, you know, I just pad it with all of those excuses. Mm-hmm. I'm working on unwinding all of that bullshit and um, just saying this is the best I can do. I like that. That's, <laughs> that's a tough, I mean, it takes a lot of just self-awareness to even realize that, that you need to improve on that or to go there, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, um, do you think people do that with their health too? Like, yeah, I'm not really trying. Like, I just kind of took this year off. Yeah. And so like, yeah, you know, whatever. I'll just, as long as I'm happy. I think how you do anything is how you do everything. So you can start to address the way that you function in a relationship or the way that you address the way that you function in your career or in your physical body through any one of those other outlets. You know, so perhaps you could leverage one of your strengths, say you're really good at, at you know, business or you're really good at you know, connecting with your wife or whatever it may be. I think you can leverage on the strengths that you have in that relationship and then that can spill into the way that you, your relationship with your own physical body. Um, but yeah, I think, it's, I think everything spills into everything else. You know, for, so for some people, the, one specific outlet might not be like the easiest for them um, but I think if you focus on anything and start to become more proficient with whatever that activity is, eventually it can start to trickle in. Yeah. But I think at the same time, there are a lot of people that perhaps they're really good in business, but they don't do very well in relationship. So maybe that doesn't actually serve all the time. But I think, I think there is something to how you do anything is how you do everything. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to be good at everything, right? We, we kind of specialize as, but like you said, I mean, maybe how you talk to yourself or how you talk to your spouse or how you talk to your employees or whatever, like that's going to carry over, like you're saying, how you do something. Well, it's all a projection of how you talk to yourself in the end, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, like your ability to connect with other people is just, it's a direct representation of where you're at with yourself. And so we were talking about before how it's like, there's some people you talk to and they're like, you know, it's like, oh, there's something about that, this person, there's something like they always, people are always telling their life story. Yeah. You know, they're always like, they have like these deep connections with people like immediately upon meeting them. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, it's just because that's where they're at. You know, so we're continually attuning to each other, connecting with each other exactly where the other person's at. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I think that's what people are kind of like, uh, they're, it's almost like, like ingredients inside of a stew. You know, so for some people, you need to attune to a person that maybe has more structure in their life and they can kind of organize you and pull you together. For some other people, it's helpful to attune to someone that's more loose and colorful and, you know, dynamic. You know, so that's why it's you know, like the Jim Rohn quote, you become the product of the five people you spend the most time with because we're literally like right now, we're attuning to each other. Yeah. You know, not only are we breathing in each other's bacteria and inocula- inoculating ourselves to that bacteria that we're breathing in, um, but there's interesting research around uh, the, our, our hearts attuning to each other as well, the uh, frequencies from our brains attuning to each other. So when you're in a room with someone, you literally start to kind of like, a part of creating rapport is kind of like getting on the same wavelength as that person. Mm-hmm. It's kind of interesting. It's super fascinating. And, and it seems like there's a bigger plan because you know, the, like you said, maybe someone needs more loosey-goosey people in their life to chill out or whatever or yeah. whatnot. But it seems like things happen the way they should happen, whether or not we like the consequence or not. You know, but it seems like if we're, if we're being authentic with ourselves, we'll meet the right people. And it seems like, gosh, if I was not at the store at this time, I wouldn't have saw this person, you know, all these things. So yeah, totally. I think, um, you know, because... <clears throat> you probably get a lot of people running into your website and you see the comments on Instagram where people say they have this autoimmune disease, they're broke, their family, you know, there's bad stuff happens, right? To good people, right? But it seems like there's a lot of like negative inertia around some people in their life. And it, it makes me wonder, is it an energetic thing that's causing these things to happen? Or is it just a, a happenstance? Like, yeah, I, I don't know, so. do you ever? Yeah, man. Yeah, I think in retrospect, every bad thing that's happened um, there's some lesson on the other side of that that I never would have been able to access had I not experienced that. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think that when you go through terrible, dark moments, I feel like there's almost like a pendulum that has the potential to swing to the opposite side in direct, recip- reciprocal directly to how dark it went. Mm-hmm. You know, so people that are going through like deep depressions and all that stuff, I think there's almost the light on the other side of that is like, wow, you're going to have so much more empathy on the other side of this thing. You're going to be able to help so many more people. 
you know, versus someone that's just been in this like median neutral space their whole life. And they're like, wow, they're always just kind of like vanilla, nice, like all righty. Yeah. That person's like, that's great, but they're probably not going to write like a best selling book. They're probably not going to, you know, change the world in this dramatic way because they haven't tapped into this, some of those, those darker parts of themselves. It's interesting. I mean, it makes you wonder if, if depression is a feedback mechanism that you're not like you're incongruent with what your life path should be. Because I've been, you know, depressed. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's why I think using antidepressants and anti, I don't know about psychotics necessarily, but anti-anxiety medications and like all like the numbing agents that we have access to. It's like, dude, your body very likely is, is having a natural response to an environment that's uh, it's not optimal for its development. And you're getting these signals saying like, we need to change. You know, so the option is like, essentially it's like, you know, smoke is pouring through your house and the, the fire alarm is going off. So the option is like, okay, well somebody get those damn batteries out of the fire alarm, <laughs> you know, right. or the other one is like, there's somewhere, there's a fire happening. Like we have to figure out where that thing is and start hunting around like, oh my God, okay, when we got, then we got to need to do the work to extinguish the fire. You know, now we need to like restructure the house because a quarter of it burnt down. Right. That's a good way. I haven't heard that before. <laughs> I love that, man. Yeah, a lot. Of, I mean, I think we're trained to just tune out some of our, our feelings and just take the allopathic approach, just band-aid things up. And, yeah. and we don't really achieve what we're trying to achieve. But anyhow, we can go down the spirituality stuff, and I, I love that. But um, I know our audience really would like to know more about like how you got into so much more with like mobility sitting on the ground we kind of talked about some things we did some breath work which was really awesome yeah. and yeah. it must have been 20 maybe 25 minutes ago that we did the cold plunge and we went in the sauna but i'm yeah. still a little chilled and we, were, we we weren't yet recording so part of the benefits of that is just you know giving your central nervous system stimulation but also activating brown fat i mean there's a whole bunch of lit there's many benefits we can get into but yeah yeah what yeah. gets you excited about the, the cold plunge oh man well uh, so we were describing before we're getting into it, it's a controlled moment for you to practice going into like a sympathetic fight flight kind of panic freak out state. You know, so everything from like the analogy before is like maybe someone's trying to steal your wallet or you're getting there's like a street fight thing or something like that. And it's like when you're in those situations or you, you drop through, a, you're walking on some ice and you break through it, you know, and your options are just having a complete panic freak out. You know, and that's not going to get you anywhere. It's just going to make things a lot worse. Or having these repetitions before of your nervous system going into that panic state, and you're saying, "Okay, I know what this is." You know, and so I, the the cold, one of the really amazing values of it, it's just a controlled state for you to start to practice that. You know, so it's like you, what is the quote? Some president, Eisenhower, somebody, they said you you uh, the time to work on the house isn't when the hurricane's coming. Paraphrase something like that. It's like but you don't. Like time that you you're, you're painting the shutters and you're, you're structuring the place is like it's not when the weather's bad; it's when the weather's nice. Right. You know, so when we're in this situation and everything's fine, we're in Santa Monica, we're hanging out. Um, it's wise for us to figure out ways that we can kind of prepare, you know, so that when something potentially is off, we can still feel calm and comfortable and relaxed. Mm. That's a great point. You know, I used to get so irritated when I was in high school in traffic. Like uh -huh. these things that I can't control and I, I still get mildly irritated, but as you were talking about that, I was trying to think of like, well, what sort of things have I noticed? It's been about a year and a half that I've been doing the, I don't yet have the, the you know, what do you call it, a coffin freezer. We have a little yeah. trough. It gets pretty damn cold, but I, I, stuff doesn't piss me off like it used to. That's great, man. So I'm like, yeah. yeah, I never. Well, your breath is a big thing. And literally the structure of your body could be a big part of that as well. You know, so when your body is stuck up in more of like an anxious type state you know that's how you call it the, the anxious postural archetype where you see people and their their shoulders are raised up to their ears and they're kind of their breath is up in the top of their lungs and their voice might be high and they might talk really fast like they're always on too much coffee yeah, yeah. you know and they're, they're like tiptoes and they're walking around like that person they're literally sending a physiological signal through their nervous system through their their hormones through their whole system that's saying like okay you're you're panicked so you were talking before about the the photographer who removed cell phones from people. Yeah. You know, so when if you look around at people and they're staring into screens and they're staring into their cell phone and they're sitting in those positions, if you remove the phone, you're like, oh, you're sad, you're depressed. 
So that's presently, it's become the number one leading cause of disability worldwide. It was supposed to be by 2020, but it happened last year. So, so what specifically? Cell phone you no, well, so cell phones are, you know, we're using, we're staring at our screens all the time, but, yeah. but uh, depression being the number one leading cause of disability. Right, right. So now, like, that's, that's a huge deal. Yeah. That's incredible. Uh, sad. I mean, it's, it's frightening. And it's happening at younger and younger ages. There's yeah, been some books. The book iGen, have you seen that or heard about that? It was a, a researcher in San Diego. She's talked about how the increase in suicide, suicidal ideation, anxiety, depression in adolescence is at unprecedented rates compared to historical. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, yeah absolutely. So all that stuff. And so a big part of that as well is, is not just a, a postural conversation, you're hunched over, which there's all the, the stuff from Amy Cuddy, the Harvard, are you familiar with her at all? She's, she, she was the one that was really popular TED talk, like second most popular TED talk ever. Um, and it was about how being in these hunched over positions versus being in an upright position has effect on testosterone levels and cortisol levels. And then since then there was, there was some folks that were, had research that was like refuting that. And then she went back the other way and had more research that was, you know, so it's, it goes back and forth as to the direct effect on, on hormone levels. Uh, but what is more commonly accepted by everybody is that it affects the way that you think and the way that you feel. You know, so when you're in a hunched over position, for example, there's a study that was done in San Francisco University where they had students in that hunched over position, like you're staring at your cell phone, and it's easier for them to access more challenging depressive memories. When they're in a more upright, open position, it's easier for them to access more upright, happy pa moments in their past mm. because we kind of have this imprint of when I'm in this, I'm winning. You know, hunter-gatherer times, I'm standing on top of the woolly mammoth and like, ah, oh, you know, Chuck Liddell walks into the ring, ah, oh. yeah. you know, he doesn't win and go, oh, <laughs> you know, so your deeper mammalian reptilian self is all tied in to this, this physical postural dance that we're doing all day long. It's so fascinating. Yeah. You know, I didn't, 10 years ago, I would have thought what you just said was complete crap, right? Uh, but there's a book, The Charisma Myth, Olivia something, and she talks about that, like having like this bear posture. Mm. And I was in sales, you know, and that's how I got into, you know, podcasting and all that. And I used to use that in my meetings because I used to be, and I still am kind of a quiet, reserved person, but I would just like act like a little bit bigger than I am and take up more space. And it like changed my behavior. It was so crazy that, anyway, this crosstalk, like we talk about having an open mindset and, and being positive and growth mindset, but your body positioning affects the mind. You know, it's, it's a two-way street. Yeah, Super yeah. So her, so Amy Cuddy's whole thing is that the TED Talk is all fake until you make it. Uh, you know, so in a sense, you can kind of fake that postural pattern, inducing that sensation internally with of confidence, and also externally, people um, saying, "Oh wow, like you're doing good. Like what you've been working out. Like what's going on?" And you're like, "Oh yeah, I have been working out actually." Huh. You know, as opposed to people saying like. And you walk into work and you're kind of like, well, it's just my pattern, you know, whatever, you know, and walking in and they're like, oh, dude, Mike, are you okay? You're like, no, I'm fine. Why does everybody keep asking me I'm okay? You know, like, you, are you tired? Yeah. Like, no, I'm not tired. Come on. You know, and that pulls you back in. So we're always playing this two-way loop, mm -hmm. you know, so there's the internal sensation of the way that my postural patterns, the tone of my voice, the yeah. pacing of my language, all that internally is feeding back into my nervous system saying, okay, I'm good. I'm safe. I'm calm. My breath pattern feeds back and says, okay, I'm safe, I'm calm. When that breath is up in your clavicles and your shoulders are raised up or you're hunched over and you're collapsed, it's all sending those signals that, okay, I'm feeling this way. So you can start to tap into that once you learn the mechanics of the dance. That's huge, man. Gets, and you talk about a lot about that in your book too, like positioning, opening up the chest. I mean, is this, this they call it like kyphotic position? Yeah, kyphosis is just, is just being in, in this forward curve. But hyperkyphotic is, is the issue. Kyphosis is just, just having a curve in general. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, kyphosis, yeah. hyperkyphosis. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, the combination of stretching, exercises, sitting on the ground, like, I mean, you dive into the details in the book and so forth, but like the average person just like listening, if they're like, look, I just need to start somewhere. What are some things that I can do to like change my body language, which would then affect my mood and my affect. Well, to go back to stay on the same thread with like cell phones yeah. and, and being stuck in that position all the time. Um, there's a interesting fella that I'm meeting up with this week actually called Andrew Huberman. 
um, that he's pioneered a lot of the research around how vision affects our autonomic nervous system. And when we're in this myopic focused visual state, it's sending a signal for us to be in more of like executive, sympathetic, fight, flight, go, attack. When we pull out and go into more of that panoramic view, so think like when you are uh, looking over the ocean or looking over the mountains or something like that, yeah, yeah. immediately, like just take a moment, kind of like visualize for yourself, like what does that feel like? You're like, oh, wow. Right. Like that's the reaction with everybody. Because yeah. we're all just a bunch of bacterial organisms. You know, so <laughs> our eyes, you know, it's, we have, you know, we wear our, our, our pants and we got our wallet and we have our car and all that stuff. But underneath that were millions of years of evolution. And what that's been is when you're looking out over the savanna, you know, you're taking it in. You're not under threat. All of a sudden, yeah. whoo, your eyes go, whoo, they pierce through the woods and say, what the hell was that? Mm -hmm. You know, either I need to hunt it or I think it's hunting me. Whoo. You know, and so we go to like, like you know, uh, Wednesday Martin, I was on a podcast with her recently, she wrote, she's, she's interesting, she uh, had a great now. she's like, she's like, yeah, when we're looking at the phone, we're trying to, we're trying to shoot the Instagram post right between the eyes. You know, <laughs> yeah. so like, like our deeper mammalian self, like that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. And so something that a person could do is get your face out of your phone, you know, and so when you are using your phone, just, or your computer, for example, put it near a window. You know, and ideally open the window so you're getting that full spectrum of light in and also getting the air and, you know, the, the fight insides and the whole Shinrin Yoku nature bathing stuff. Like, yeah. get it into your house. Right. You know, we live in these sterilized environments and we're staring into these phones that are inherently stressing us out and these postural patterns that are inherently depressive and anxious. Mm -hmm. And then we're going out and reaching for, for medications in order to, to restore us back to normal. Meanwhile, really what we needed to do was like, take our shoes off, put our phone down, go for a walk. Right. And other stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to, yeah. Easier said than done for some people. But there's so much medicine in that. Yeah. You know, the, the, the layers of your sight as you're taking a walk, looking out into the trees, look up into the distance, look, look up close. Um, you know, the actual moving pattern in itself, noticing your posture as you're out there walking. You know, notice your, the, the way in which you breathe as you're out there walking. Noticing the quality of the air, noticing the quality of the light. All of this stuff is moving us. It's so key. Yeah, I mean, some people just say would say to that, well, I go to the gym, I exercise, I hop on the treadmill 30 minutes, like my doctor said that's good. But there's another benefit that I think people are not looking at. And a requirement like in our house now is like we have to go for a little hike in our backyard area that's like wooded and everything like that, like every night after dinner. And that's just like what we do. Yeah. And it's our sleep, like our relationships, like everything, my daughter's running, like it really does something above and beyond just getting your heart rate up. Uh -huh. Like you're speaking about. Yeah. Well, that's the relationship it. stuff is huge. Yeah. You know, so the, one of the fastest ways to get us back into more of a, a calm, parasympathetic, rest, digest type place is through interactive play. You know, so when you are able to connect and interact with another person, you get into more of that like that social engagement system from like a polyvagal Stephen Porges kind of perspective. I don't know if you're familiar with the whole no, vagus nerve, it. polyvagal stuff. Anyways. He describes kind of like a ladder that you can go through with your nervous system. And at the top of that is being in more of this social engagement place. And when we're in that social engagement, we're more in more of this calm, relaxed, restored place in our nervous system. Versus when we're in that separation and disconnection and guarding and protecting and punching, you know, all those other places, it's kind of like that separation. You know, so something as simple as, as you know, playing pickup soccer or football or ultimate frisbee or... Yeah acro yoga or uh, dance um, there's just there's so many different layers that you're stacking in with that and I think going to the gym and having your alone time and just focusing on the weights is valuable too yeah but I think incorporating a level of, of, of fun and, and play is really valuable and how do you structure that I mean you're a pretty physically fit guy I mean it looks like if I didn't know that you were into yoga and bodyweight exercises and stretching I would think you just you know, you lift weights like you do powerlifting or bodybuilding style workouts, but yeah. you have a nice balance. And some of the workouts you've done at Gold's Venice are pretty impressive. Like when you're comparing these different modalities together, yeah. um, how does one, because people like programs, right? They want to know, hey, what exercises do I do five days a week? Like how do you emphasize, you know, the stretching, the acro yoga and the play? Yeah, I think the first primary thing is finding something that you actually enjoy doing. 
um, you know, it's like consistency is just so important and actually looking forward to like we have so much work in our lives. Um, you know, so I think that having an accountability partner is a really great thing because it's also packed into that is community, um, connection, you're messaging your friend, okay, we're going to meet up, yeah. we're going to do this thing together, you know, because we're so separated and isolated inside of our phones and our computers and, you know, inside of our cars and inside of our houses and, you know, that's, it's all very strange totally. how disconnected we are from everybody. Yeah. And then this obligation, this sense of, of obligation that we need to be completely autonomous. And it's like, in reality, like, no, you don't, man. <laughs> like, you're going to do better, actually, with a community. Yeah. You know, and so it's, I think that, that having an accountability partner or having, like, maybe some, like, a group fitness thing that keeps you regular, I think, is very valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, something that's, like, it's, it's in the schedule. There's a teacher there. They're going to be teaching. They're going to be breaking it down. I think for people that are, like, looking to enter into a more healthy, fit place, I think having something like that is really valuable. Yeah. Um, but infusing joy into it I think is such a big deal uh, and then also gaining momentum through the way that you live at your home you know yeah. so spend more time on the ground yeah. you know so something as simple as like get some floor cushions or a comfy rug or like a low table in your kitchen or something like that so you can you know maybe drink tea or coffee or check your emails while you're sitting in the ground kind of like in a yoga type position mm -hmm. you know or like maybe the CrossFit type position you go 90-90 yeah. with the legs or you could straddle the legs you know and then when you have to get up from the ground you're going through that full range of motion with your hips and your knees and your ankles so now all of a sudden you've infused that healthy movement function into a larger part of your day so now you have momentum when you go to the gym yeah right so it's easier injury is reduced all that everything wow yeah so cultures so like it's like north africa and, and eastern mediterranean and southeast asia uh, places, cultures where people are spending more time on the ground with regularity. They have minimal to no incidence of osteoarthritis of the hips, of the knees. Fall risk, as we were talking about this before, is like off the table, like fall risk. Yeah. Like, what do you mean you can't get up? Right. You know, that for us is very common as you get into older age because we've created such a large chasm between standing like at 90 degrees with the hips and the ground. Like that space there is like no man's land for most of Western culture. Yeah. And so if you're away from that for long enough, all of a sudden it becomes this, the chasm gets larger and larger and larger and larger until you can't jump across it anymore. And now I have to have like a little red button with me all the time in case I get down to the ground. Oh man, that is so <laughs> sad but so true, man. So you've looked into some of this research on, on different cultures. So a lot of people do sit on the ground. Yeah, man. Wow. Most of the world since the beginning of ever, yeah, you know, like chairs is new. I mean, that's like royalty in Egypt was like the beginning, the beginning of that. Is that right? Yeah. Like the people that were privy to a chair, it was like you were a prince or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like the, it's like the uh, yeah the the the, the wealthy uh, affluent the disease of what is it what is it affluenza is what my buddy um, Chris Ryan you know, sex uh, sex at dawn he's got okay. a new book coming out civilized to cool. death about the similar conver conversation I got that term from him in our uh, yeah affluenza you know so affluent culture mm -hmm. they start to have all of this disease because they're s outsourcing that natural movement that feeds them at a cellular emotional mental spiritual level but for the sake of science at a cellular level since the beginning of you being just a single cell organism if you believe in evolution right, right. You know, so since the beginning of you you have had these movements and you've been all the way down to the ground and you're sitting around the fire on the ground. You weren't sitting in a chair on the fire. That's crazy. Talk. Maybe a stump, maybe. Sure. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Maybe a stump. But you, even you within that stump, you'd, had, you'd have adaptation because, okay, well, it's a new stump today. You know, how do I sit in that position? But typically, since you were a, a baby, you would be on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so if you didn't have this culture that was, you know, beds are raised up to this height, yeah. toilets are raised up to this height, Toilet to defecate, to take a poo. Uh, when you're in that squat position, it's a part of your evolution to go into a deep squat. Yeah. Your rectum literally elongates so that you can defecate properly. When you're in that 90 degree pose, the, your rectum is still has a little bit, it's still at an angle, it's called the anorectal angle. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in that position, it's literally going against your physiology. So now you're, sitting on, now you're sitting on the toilet staring at your cell phone for you know, five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever while you're like 
second. That has nothing to do with being a human. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so do you have the squatty potty? Where do you... I have a... Uh, I will actually squat on my toilet like an extra weirdo. Okay. I don't expect that to be... For anybody to do that. I right. think it's strange. Um, so like on the toilet I, seat itself. Yeah. 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 Dude, I knew you are hardcore, but you're <laughs> hardcore, man. <laughs> Only because I like it. It feels yeah. good. Um, nice. But yeah, squatty potties are great. But you, okay, but or if you if you want to be a, next a level, stool or anything, my wife's gonna come in the bathroom, dude. Mike, what are you doing? Uh, yeah, I mean, what? it takes like a lot of hip mobility for that to be like a comfortable thing. Right. But I like the sensation of doing a deep squat. And it you know, it's good. a full bowel evacuation. It would be full anyway. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I don't always do that. I'll you know, if I sit on a normal, it's a, a big part of it is like, what's your diet like and what's your regularity like. Um, you can know the difference. If you're constipated, there's a lot of things to look at it, um, but mechanics is one of the levels to look at. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I mean, standing desks and all that are, are pretty hot, and I, I do that a lot at home and stuff like that, but what would be, would, do you like to moderate that, personally, for hip mobility? Yeah, so integrate, so alternate between standing and actually being on the ground. Yeah. And if you're doing that, then a chair's not a big deal. The only reason a chair is a big deal is because we're completely inundated inundated with that since the beginning of being in strollers and being in like car seats for children you know so as a child you go through all these evolutionary patterns of the cross crawl pattern and you're rolling onto your belly and you're extending your spine and you come into that deep squat on your haunches and then you stand all the way up you know, so you're integrating your neurology you're in you're integrating your all of yourself through that, those movement patterns and then we put you into kind of like re regress you back into this hunched over fetal position. And then we go into kindergarten and it begins, okay, not only are you gonna be sitting in that hunched over kind of like archetypal depressed type position, not to say that it absolutely just causes depression, but nonetheless, if you look at a person in that position, you're usually like, oh, what's going on? Um, now we're saying, okay, you have to be in that. And if you get the urge to move, well, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Yeah. You need medicine. <laughs> um, so I would alternate between standing and getting all the way down on the ground. Yeah. And also make sure you put your computer near a window. Yeah. So you, so you can flex the eyes. It's been huge. I mean, just, just I mean, I wear blue blockers and stuff from Blue Blocks. I know you, yeah, yeah, you, you yeah. like those as well. But yeah. just being outside, it's like it, you don't even need those because you get the natural sunlight. So it's just doing your work outside is amazing. Get as much sun exposure throughout the day as you can. Yeah. You know, if you're living on the equator and you happen to be from like, you know, English descent, then maybe temper that. Um, but for, it just depends on how light your skin is, you know, and how close to the equator you are. Uh, but your body has a pretty good mechanism for letting you know when you got too much sun. Yeah. You're like, oh, I, I can feel it. Yeah. It's kind of like when you drink too much water. <laughs> you know, you're like, I think I'm good. Right. Like, we're not idiots. <laughs> people t people tune out those signals though. But yeah. getting back to the sitting on the on the floor, right? What are some benefits? I mean, because you've had a lot of clients, you do e classes and things like that. Yeah. Like, what are some stories that you hear about Sally Smith with three kids that says, you know, hey, I'm gonna even though my husband must think I'm crazy, I'm gonna start sitting on the floor more, or whatever. What do you hear? Like, what are people telling you about? Within days, their hip mechanics and hip mobility completely starts to change. It's very cool. You know, so, so people like starting off in a position like this, when they first get down, they're like, oh God, it's terrible. You know, especially, especially like big stiff, stiff dudes. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've had innumerable clients at this point that they, I just like, okay, cool. Like you have this hip stuff or this knee stuff or ankle stuff or whatever. Mm -hmm. What are you doing throughout your day that actually mobilizes those joints and takes them through a full range of motion? Mm -hmm. Not even, not only just the mobility aspect of going through the range of motion, but also the circulation aspect. You know, your body is essentially a big pond. You know, so you need to pump all of those different fluid sacs from every square centimeter of you in order for that place to be healthy. How do we pump those sacks? It's not from just sitting in the same sedentary, static position all day long where our legs are kind of hung up down below us. Yeah. The way that you do it is maybe squat, maybe lunge, maybe be on your, maybe kneel for a little bit, maybe toe sit for a little bit, 90-90 position, straddle, sukhasana, lay on your belly, lay on your side, stand up, mm -hmm. sit on a chair, Repeat. Yeah, yeah. You do that, now you're really flushing all of those different fluid sacs throughout your system, and it makes it a lot harder for any form of, of disease to manifest in that space. 
I love that. You know, there's a lot of research on uh, stagnant lymph and lymph flow. Yeah. Like this making its exactly. way to Spirit. academic research and everything like that. And yeah. everything you just talked about is a natural way to move. That's I mean, it. people have these trampolines, they call them rebounders and that. Yeah. It's like, okay, that's cool. You're doing a little bit. But like you said, why not just keep this thing going all day? Of course. Think of any hunter, gatherer, tribesman, any person like living in the world today. And imagine pulling in like a $15,000 vibration plate into some tribe. <laughs> They'd be like, what are you doing? Yeah. You're like, oh, it's the, it's the new technology. You're like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. Like, have you have you walked five miles today or yeah. any miles today? Yeah. You're like, no, no, no. I'm sitting on the computer and then I vibrate myself. Yeah. <laughs> I know, man. I love tech, but yeah, some of this stuff is crazy. <laughs> and so, sound, like yeah. the concept of walking five miles maybe might sound like insane to people. Take your meetings, instead of sitting at a coffee shop where you drove in your car and you sat there, and then you walk into the coffee shop and you stand in front of the thing and you order coffee, and then you sit down and your face moves while you communicate to another person, what would happen if you just took a walk with them? Yeah. And you both got to serve your own biology while you started to you know, contemplate on how to take over the world or whatever you're into. Right. It's, it makes for a better meeting. Makes for a better meaning, man. Yeah, yeah you're stimulating creativity as you're doing that. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I have a client now, friend, Ben Lynch. We used to, that's how we started doing our meetings back in 2012. And now it's like been a great long-term relationship and we're, we're good friends. But he would always demand, hey, let's go for a hike. Perfect. And I, I thought he meant like walk around the parking lot. So I was wearing like my normal business stuff. And we took like a three mile hike in my, it was awesome. You know, now I always try and do walks, you know. Yeah. But, and when you're hanging with, when you start connecting with people that are, what I would consider to be like really truly successful, mm-hmm. you're usually not wearing business suits. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Mark Zuckerberg doesn't come in a meeting like, okay, I'm ready to talk about. Yeah. It's like, no, he's comfortable. Right. <laughs> right. It's, it's almost yeah. a mask, right? <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, I've transcended the tie. Yeah. I can do it as a costume and it's fun. It's great. Right. You know, but I want to, I want to, throughout the day, I want to stack as many healthy variables as I can. You know, and so one of those, in this case that you're describing, is like, okay, cool, let's go for a hike. Yeah. You know, so now we're driving all these different gradients and we're having to take our body through these different ranges of motion. We're also, um, we're getting diff- sun exposure. We're also looking out into the distance over the mountains. You know, so we're getting to feed ourselves as we're talking about, you know, paperwork or whatever. Yeah. I like the approach of like pick your path, you know, but I think a lot of people are so prescriptive and like how many steps do I get per day? When do I exercise? Do I burn more fat? And I'm guilty of like promoting this and talking about circadian rhythms and fat oxidation tends to be a little bit higher in the morning, but exercise when you can. But I love how you're kind of reinforcing this, like kind of just do what the very things, you know, and just. Yeah, vary it up. Yeah, adaptability. The big thing is just integrating more effective movement into your life. You know, and figuring out, okay, well, like, what the heck does that mean? Um, one is figuring out, like, basic mechanics of movement. Yeah. You know, so another thing that you could play with, which is one of the chapters in the book, is, is hinging from your hips. You know, so most of us, as we are going through and, you know, chopping your vegetables or putting butter on your toast or, you know, whatever you're doing, picking something up off the ground, yeah. we're hinging from our thoracic spine as opposed to hinging from the place that we actually have, you know, it's the strongest joint complex in the whole body. The glutes are, like they can pick up up hundreds of pounds. Thoracic spine is not built to do that, Mm. you know, and then you crunch the neck up and literally your central nervous system starts to shut you down because it doesn't trust you in that position. So if you can start to cultivate a little bit more length through your spine, which is what yogis and dancers and martial artists have been talking about since ever, yeah. um, start to create that length through that spine and then pick something up off of the ground as you're hinging your hips and maybe come down to a knee or maybe squat all the way down for it. Um, as you're brushing your teeth or chopping that, those vegetables, is it possible that I can maintain length through my spine, hinge at the hips, maybe lower myself down so I can stay long and stacked the whole time? You know, if you can do that, then you're, you're, it's the same thing as before. You're, that momentum is moving into your workout or into your business meeting. Right. That's huge. You know, a lot of people, Aaron, complain about back pain. Uh-huh. You know, they can't, they can't exercise because they have a bad back or they have bad this and that. Yeah. Um, and so does that tie into similar things that we're talking about? A lot of like yeah. lumbar issues and everything like that? Absolutely. Or- yeah. So you just did the thing. Yeah. Like you just changed positions. Yeah. That's it. It was kind of like, it's like, eh. That's the whole thing. There's no one static position that's like, 
Yeah. We figured it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've solved it. It's like, no. Like, we've been sitting here for the last 25 minutes or whatever it is. Your body naturally is like, man, I'd really like to kind of twist over to the side here. That's the thing that doesn't happen when you're on the, the easy sofa recliner thing. Your body just... It'll just kind of disconnect from that thing for the next two and a half hours while we watch the movie or whatever. You know, so something as simple as that, you're massaging all those tissues and mobilizing your hips, and now you're in this external rotation with one side of the hip and medial rotation with the other side of the hip. You're flossing that joint out, moving out all that lymphatic stuff and recirculating all those healthy fluids back into the, into the lower spine, into the sacrum, into the... That's healing your spine. And then when we get up from this position, we're going to have to, like we mentioned before, we're going to have to go through essentially like a Turkish getup, mm -hmm. you know? And so we can start to infuse those basic movement patterns into our daily life just by doing something as simple as spending more time on the ground. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah and, you know, and people, the centenarians are gardening, they're moving around, they're naturally kind of doing this, right? I mean, yeah, but, yeah. but, you know, we were kind of jokingly talking about it, but it's actually a reality is, is there's really no demand realistically for people to do this stuff. You can order your food off Uber Eats or Whole Foods Deliver or whatever. So people are just not moving anymore. Yeah, so you have to make, so within a mold that is structured in such a way where, you know, obesity is through the roof and all the stuff that we're, that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like the, the mold that Western culture, the, 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 aff, the affluenza, this, the, the state of that mold is such that it presses people out to become kind of sick. Yeah. Um, so you have to make active steps to start to kind of like reintegrate some of those movement principles back into your life. It's fine, it's a good thing. Right. You know, so another simple thing that you could do that you know, will only make you feel better and will only make your life of your family and people that you are around better is get a pull-up bar for your house so that when you walk through the doorway, you just do a little hang. You know, so it doesn't need to be this crazy thing where I'm suggesting that people like stand on their head while they, you know, eat yeah. air or something. And like, yeah. that's the key to health. It's like, get a stupid little pull-up bar mm -hmm. and just whoosh, As you're doing that, you're opening up the space through the lungs. You're starting to move, you're literally restructuring the shape of the shoulder girl. There's a whole book uh, by a guy called John Kurz, uh, or Dr. Kirsch rather, um, called Shoulder Pain, question mark. And his recommendation is just, a, he's an orthopedic surgeon, uh, it's just a minute and a half of hanging each day. Um, and to what he claims in there is that it's able to, to rid, he says 99%, I feel like, that, like that's a lot, yeah. um, of people's shoulder pain, chronic shoulder pain. Wow. You know, so just spending, going on this protocol of hanging each day, um, I recommend different positions. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can go overhand, underhand, wide, narrow, mm -hmm. mix it up. Yeah. Uh, but it it's another chapter in the book is, is getting into like what that looks like. Yeah. Um, but just going through various different ranges of motion, hanging a total of a minute and a half. So that could be 15 seconds, six times a day, but literally, or you know, whatever you want, but literally just every time you're walking through that doorway, just give yourself a little woo. That's awesome. I so saw in, in, your, in your bedroom, you have a pull up bar. Yeah. 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 yeah so like if you, as you go to the bathroom, you just, whatever. Yeah. yeah. That's such a great, I mean, people can do that. Those things are what, 20 bucks? I mean, they're probably Target. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, those are the things is you need to change the, your, your visual space. Mm -hmm. If you don't see it, if it's out of sight, then it'll be out of mind. Yeah. You know, so making it so a very simple thing is get comfy rugs and comfy places to you know, get down on the ground. You know, put a yoga mat down on the ground. Maybe get a foam roller, put that down on the ground. Maybe throw a kettlebell down there, a couple yeah. of crossballs, you know, bands, whatever it is. Have that down there. So it's like, okay, cool, I got like a little section. Like, we hang out there. Yeah. That's you know, awesome. and then have the pull-up bar up, and then you know the, the same thing. Take the meetings outside, take a walk, mm -hmm. uh, make sure that you're using the that visual spectrum. You're going through the full range of motion on a regular on a regular basis. Yeah. If you can start to infuse that into your environment, then just your existence, you become a healthier person. Mm -hmm. As opposed to saying, okay, disregard the environment. It's you know it's it is the way that it is, and I'll do more Tybo. I have a question for you. So you yeah. used to be in, into bodybuilding and everything like that. So knowing what you know now, right? Like you were probably counting calories, training X number of times per week, different yeah. body parts and all that. How much healthier would you say that Aaron is now compared to when you were doing everything by the book? 
So the big health change that I've experienced, and I'm just on like the journey, like I haven't like arrived in any place. There's still all sorts of shit that I'm, I'm sorting out. Yeah. Um, but the big thing that I would say is what I had been doing, most everything was out of insecurity. You know, and so I was packing on as much muscle as I possibly could to let the world know that I'm like strong enough and big enough and can protect. Uh, you know, so getting past that and more starting to change my the structure of my, my movement in this case in such a way that it's it's always reasons to to bring more joy into my life. You know, so if you invite me to go do a thing, if it doesn't create more joy, then I'm like, why are we going to do that? You know, and so previously it was it was more of counting calories and it was more just hypertrophy training and just like breaking muscles down and lots of staring at myself in the mirror and like, yeah, yeah. Um, but wasn't happy. You know, and so it was and it's, and it's like it didn't make me any maybe temporarily it made me feel a little happier, um, but it's making the person me in this case happier based off of something that can be taken away. You know, and so at any time you can lose your your physical body. You know, so if you're putting too much energy into just like how it looks, um, that's really shaky ground to, to put your, your, your sense of well-being on. Oh yeah, one small injury or something. I mean, you're, you're, yeah, your whole world will crumble. Whole world will crumble. Yeah. yeah, so you're setting yourself up for, for pain in a sense because at some point you're going to be an old dude right. you know, or old woman. You know, and you're not going to be able to look in the mirror and be like, oh, like, yeah. Like you at some point will have to evolve out of that. You know, so the sooner that you can get to a point, like the, the, the currency that has the greatest amount of value is uh, relationships, without a doubt. <laughs> you know, like monetary currency is great. It's, you know, it's convenient in a lot of ways, um, but it can be taken away. You know, but by you creating, making your fitness and your movement be more something that actually integrates you with community in a greater way, um, I think that that's a deeper le level of protection than you know, just be obsessing over your biceps will ever create. So if you were to record that and then play that back, you can go back in time, play that to the 18 year old Aaron, would you have heard that or would you have said, no, I no, I wouldn't have heard that. I'd see some stupid hippie, yeah. which is great. Right. You know, so that's, I think it's, it's important to go through, you know, for a lot of people, myself in this case, um, I typically need to bang my head up against a wall to the point that it's just like a bloody uncomfortable mess. <laughs> And I'm like, wow, this wall is really not moving. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's not, it's not moving. Yeah. You know, and eventually, yeah, yeah. eventually I'm like, oh, wow, there's like a door two feet to the other side. But I just, I really needed that to be the way. Um, and so I think that's great. I think, yeah. I, I think, you know, just drive yourself into that closed wall till it hurts so much that you have to create a change. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. That's how people learn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a good thing. So to, for, for comparison's <laughs> sakes, like you're what, like 6'2"? Six six, between 6'4 six and 6'5. So okay. it's like right in the middle. And you're like 195 right now, roughly? 220. Two well, 20. right now I just fasted for the last couple of days, so I'm probably less. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, 215 probably. Wow. And how big were you when you were training a lot? The biggest, so when I was like 16, I was like 230, wow. which is big for a 16 year old. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, that was about the biggest that I was, I was ever at. I see. So yeah. that's, I mean, that's a big jump. Yeah. 15 pounds. Yeah. 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 I mean, not, it's not, it's not insane, obvious, honestly, right. but, um, yeah, it was more in my, in my mind, I think what was the, the, the vast, the reasoning behind difference. it. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And then breath work, you know, we did a, we will demonstrate, you know, some of the breath work that we did before going into the cold plunge, but, yeah, sure. um, how do you integrate that into your life? Is it something that you start your day? Pay with? attention to your breath every time you're taking a walk. You know, so as we're hanging out here talking, if you maybe there's like a moment where you might feel anxious or nervous or uncomfortable or anything like that, um, watch your breath and see where it's at because it'll be a one-to-one -one connection. It will tell you exactly where your nervous system is at. Yeah. You know, so if there's a there's a moment where you know you're freaking out and, and there's like a tick not how do you say his name tick not Han, tick not Han. Anyways, tick not Han. I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. Um, I he has a I heard a thing from him where he was talking about there was all these refugees on this boat in Vietnam and everybody's freaking out. And he said all it took was one person to remain calm to be able to infuse that through the boat and everyone else be like, okay, cool, it's all right. You know, so if you can just come back and like, no matter what the heck chaos is going on, if you in fact like, where's my breath? 
because I know mechanically how to find that. You know, so I always have control mechanically of that. I can control that. So whatever the circumstances are, I don't have control of that. Just accept it. Yeah. yeah but yeah. what I do is what's happening in here. So I can start to change my filter on what's happening out there just by looking in and saying, okay, where's my breath at right now? You know, so as I walk down the street or as you walk down the street, just start to notice, okay, cool, does my breath feel like it's more up in my, my clavicle area? Or is, can I get this? People right now, they can put their hands around their ribs and just breathe out to the side and really feel that diaphragmatic function start to come online. Mm -hmm. And when that's happening, you'll start to feel you know, you're, you're sending a signal into your physiology saying like you're safe and you're calm. So a, a great practice people can get into, bring your hands up on your ribs at any time and just have, you know, you can say five breaths into that area. Something else that people can play with is emphasizing the breath out. So as you're breathing out, you already know this, I'm sure you're activating more of that parasympathetic side of the nervous system. Um, and then you could, what I recommend in, this, in the book is six seconds out, four second hold, four seconds in, four second hold, six seconds out, do that five times. Mm. Check in, see how you're doing after that. I yeah. guarantee you're gonna feel a dramatic state change. Oh yeah, it's huge. I mean, just people like transitioning from getting out of the car to going into the family, going into a meeting. I mean, that can be almost drug-like. You know? Oh man. It's, it's powerful. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're so, we're not in, we just think, oh, I'm anxious. I'm just an anxious person. We yeah. create these stories. And I think you can get, if you identify with being an anxious person, I think you can start to create uh, scenarios in your life that induce anxiety because you're not comfortable with anything else. Yeah. It's incredible. I mean, there's so <laughs> many different powerful things we have at our disposal, man. It's just, but you have some different tools to, uh, inside, you know, maybe we can show some video, yeah, cut yeah, to it, sure. but that, that kind of teach you how to breathe properly. Mm. Like oh it. yeah, absolutely. So I have a Native American flute and I have a didgeridoo um, yeah. and I have, I think that might be all that I have in there right now. Yeah, any wind instrument. So singing, wind instrument, right? That's the oldest instrument ever. The, the oldest instrument that, that we found was, it's called the, uh, the, what is it called? The Djevbe flute, I think is how you pronounce it. And it was, was 43,000 years ago and it was found in Slovenia and it was the, the femur of a cave bear. And wow. they, 43 god dang thousand years ago, there was some Neander whatever dude in there carving out a bear femur to play his flute. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> So it's like, it's been a part of your humanities for a really long time for you to be like, there's something good, there's something that's restorative or healing or you know rad in whatever capacity about And making those sounds come out. So as you're in, you know, singing, obviously, I would imagine it's been around a lot longer than that. Um, but as you're doing that, you are blowing out for a long time, right? So you're also, you're, you're increasing your uh, resistance to carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. which that's like Patrick McCowan, Oxygen Advantage, you know, yeah. all about nose breathing, which that's another chapter in the book. It's just all about breathing function in general. A big part of that is nose breathing being like the, 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 the major part of that throughout your day. Mouth breathing is fine sometimes, but we get into kind of more of what that is. Uh, but slowing that breath down through the nose starts to reduce your resistance to, uh, or, or your sensitivity to carbon dioxide. Mm. So when you need to take a breath, it's not because you need oxygen, it's because too much CO2 is built up and you're getting that signal, oh, get a breath again. You know, but just like anything, just like any muscle, you, know, you can build up resistance to that. All of a sudden you're a more robust breather and your red blood cells create more oxygen with every breath. And so if you become, exactly, so it's like a similar thing as like a person, if you're just like a buffet eater person, your body's like, okay, this dude just eats. Yeah. You know, and they'll figure out how to adapt to that. If you're a fast for 10 days person, your body says, okay, there's no resources, I'll figure that out. Mm -hmm. you know, so if you slow down that breath, not only does it an, an immediate, uh, in, in, in the moment, does it affect the, the state of your autonomic nervous system? But it literally affects the efficiency of your whole physiology and your whole cardiovascular system. You know, so singing, blowing through a flute, didgeridoo gets a little bit more like, you know, it's a little weirder. Yeah, um, it sounds cool. It I've, sounds I've seen cool. some of the videos you made on it. Yeah, it seems neat. Yeah, so it's, and it's, it's also been shown to be really helpful with snoring. You know, so you're strengthening all those, those glottis muscles in the back of the throat. Hmm. Um, you're creating compression in your midsection. Yeah. You know, so it's, it does everything good for your body. 
so essentially. Cool. And that's the thing is we're doing all these crazy breath practices. Yeah. Get a flute. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like what what are you isolating yourself in this and you know, which I think there's there's it's there's a lot of value to isolation and all that stuff as well. Um, but we're separating all of these different variables dance, music you know, interaction, play, all that stuff. It takes all those individual variables that we're like biohacking out and goes whoosh. Yeah. <laughs> Super fascinating, man. I mean, the breath work thing, I, I've noticed the adaptations, like you're saying, the, the resistance or the ability to tolerate, uh, you know, basically exhaust CO2. Yeah. Uh, in just a few months, since Josh Trent taught me this, what he called like a warrior type breath sequence, which uh -huh. is similar to Wim Hof's, my retention phase is like much longer. In literally just like 60 days of practice. Oh, yeah, man. Your body's, it's hungry to adapt. It loves it. That's, that's so cool, man. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's why what, Like, when you have those friends, like, my favorite friends are the friends that regularly push me. You know, because at a, at a deeper visceral cellular level, my body's like, man, I grow around that person. You know, and so people that suggest that you maybe spend more time on the ground or maybe, you know, let's jump in a cold lake. Mm -hmm. Screw it. Let's do it. Let's take your clothes off and jump in the lake. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you're crazy. I'm like, I know. Right. You're like, all right, cool. That's good. That was a good day. Totally. As yeah. opposed to always playing it safe, always staying within those confines of what normalcy is. Mm -hmm. You know, and so if you really look at the state of normalcy, um, it's, it's funny. Right. <laughs> It's, no, it's weird. It's a little funny. And so people think, yeah, what's, uh, what's common is normal, right? Because most people would not jump in the lake or would not jump in that. And so that's, yeah, they think you're crazy. But they don't realize the benefits of, like, stretching your boundaries and how that feels. I mean, the, the sense of accomplishment, like knowing that you can stay in cold water for three minutes or whatever, yeah. it's pretty cool. You're like, well, I can write this extra email or if I need to approach this person that may seem intimidating or... Whatever, get yeah. in front of a stage or a group of people. And, and so, yeah, I think having that, instilling that into your day on a regular basis, I think is super valuable. Um, and it's also knowing where your border is and like, kind of like the art or the dance, maybe science of living right at your border, mm. you know, and respectfully nudging it. Yeah. But not necessarily always being like blowout guy. Yeah, you because know, blowout guy usually doesn't last either. I think. Yeah, no, you were. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. You know, so it's so it's it's knowing. It's like okay, I know I know what my edge is. Like yeah. I'm self aware enough to be like, okay, this is, I think I'm hurting myself. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm yeah. pretty sure. You know, back it up. You know, and do that. Push that edge a little bit for ten days, for ten months. You know, now we're like, wow, I'm like a totally different person. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I think that that's a really valuable tool just to 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 bear witness to of yourself of like uh, being sensitive to where my borders are and being courageous enough to just like nudge them just enough. Mm -hmm. And all that relates to body work as well, which might be a stretch of an analogy. But if you push too much on someone's tissue, then they'll contract and restrict. Mm -hmm. But if you pu don't push enough on somebody's tissue, then they're like, what the hell are we doing here? Mm -hmm. So right. it's, it's literally, it's Find the exact out. same analogy. You know, so in, in tissue, if you can find that point of resistance and sit at it just enough to send that signal in, like, dude, you're dehydrated here, you're agglomerated, the cells are just bound together, like, we need to do something about this. Right. Then your body comes online and says, okay, cool, all right, let's twist the arm a little bit and start to unwind that, reach through that, like, we can do that. I feel safe enough to change my shape. Mm -hmm. But if I say, like, F you, I'm, I'm changing you, your body says, get out of here, I don't trust it. Yeah. Because it's all working with the nervous system. So the way that you change your physical body is the same way that you change your mind, is the same way that you change your business, the same way that you interact with relationships. It's all the same stuff. Yeah. So it comes back to, I think, that how you do anything is how you do everything. Such a great point. Such a good message. I mean, such a good take-home strategy. Um, you shared a ton of tips here, Aaron. What's one thing that you wish, like a, a habit or routine or something that maybe 10 years ago you didn't do that you've learned? Or maybe it's something you've learned on the podcast, like just like the most profound thing that you are doing now that you didn't used to do, what would it be? Man, I think, I mean, it's so cheesy. I think meditation, man. Yeah. I think being, my tendency has been to continue just doing, do, 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 do. You know, like that was, that was my solution. Like, well, I can just do more. 
you know, but then through discovering things like fasting for a very obvious example, you're like, wow, progressively I feel more and more healthier and stronger and clearer the more that I reduce. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Bruce Lee, it's about reduction, not addition, or subtraction, not addition. You know, like a lot of smart people have said that same thing in different ways. You know, so I think cutting away, and even in the sense of like, if I have, you know, some mental turmoil or something like that, um, I think there's a place to, to do in order to, to work with that. But I think a primary solution for me that I'm finding, that I'm actually s finally starting to like look forward to, is silence and just sitting with things and, and not being, you know, overly attached to being successful. What the hell is successful? Right. Yeah. Different. <laughs> yeah. For me, for me, success is walking my kid to school and picking her up. That's, that's beautiful. A, that's my, but uh, yeah, everyone has their own kind of definition, you know, of like what success is, but yeah, it's uh, interesting. Well, so, even successful in the sense of like, a, in like a micro sense of like little successes throughout, you know, you can even have, be attached to successes in meditation, yeah. you know, and so like you mentioned, you did some Vipassana meditation and that, you know, if you say you felt you had a transcendent moment or some shit like that, yeah. or you, you felt blue light coming out of your third eye, you know, whatever. Yeah. You have that during the meditation, the meditation teacher would be like, great. Don't attach to it. Yeah, let yeah. go of that. Yeah, yeah. No big deal. Please, yeah. let go of that. Because yeah. right behind that is going to be excruciating hip pain. <laughs> you know, and right behind that is going to be, I need to get the hell out of this room right now. These people are crazy. I feel anxious and depressed. Mm -hmm. And right behind that is going to be another elevation, lifted, light, love moment. Right. And then right behind that is another, I need to chop my hip off. <laughs> <laughs> so if you attach to any one of those, you're screwed. Totally. <laughs> that was my biggest mistake because I, I would always say like, well, how do I get back to that place? So I'm like, that's not the point. That's not it. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I want to get there. Like, like, <laughs> like, why are some sessions good and bad? They're like, that's what it is. That's what it is. And man. it took me like, like you were saying, bang your head. It took me forever to figure this shit out, man. But anyway, oh man, we could talk all day about this stuff. Um, yeah. So you've been podcasting since 2015, yeah. end of 2014. End of yeah, whatever, yeah. Yeah, you the got last, your online like, programs. Four and a half years, yeah. It's awesome, man. I mean, you got a lot of stuff online. Your Instagram, you do share a lot of great stuff. Um, and then you got the book coming out in December. Got the book. We're doing it. December 24th, it releases. Um, yeah, is that so a people Tuesday? can. Yes, it's I'm pretty sure it is. That's what the publishers demanded. Yeah. yeah, I'm like Christmas Eve. But if people do pre order the book, um, they they will receive it. So says Amazon. Actually, oh, on the twenty fourth. So nice. it actually works out as a really great Christmas gift. Totally. Um, and if they pre order it at thealignbook.com, okay. um, just a l i g n book.com, uh, the a l i g n book.com, um, we'll have some type of uh, bonus. We haven't established that bonus yet sure. because this is like three months before that yeah. date. Um, but something good, some type of either free online program or free giveaway gift, something something actually meaningful and cool. Nice. You know, instead of some just some PDF. Yeah, some PDF stuff. bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, we, cool. we don't want to do that. Cool. No, your, your <laughs> demonstrations are really like detailed and everything along those lines. But so this is a book. So my mom has hip issues and stuff like that. Um, there's a ton of pictures in there that can help her kind of get started. Oh, man. Yeah, so what the book is is a field manual or user's manual on how to effectively drive your body or use your body or inhabit your body in any situation. You know, so the, 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 what will be delivered, what a person will get from this book by the end of it is any instance, any moment throughout your day, you will have a, a stack of effective tools to be able to you know, become stronger, become more flexible, become more calm, become more energetic. You'll actually understand the language and the mechanics of how to, how to do that in any situation. I love that. As opposed to it being like, I'm dependent on Pilates or I'm dependent on yoga or I'm dependent on CrossFit. It's like, no, no, no. We're sitting here right now. There's a whole plethora of tools that we can access. We just don't know what the heck they are. Yeah. So I took you know, what I've learned over the last 16 years working with clients or you know, five years doing the podcast or you know, whatever, just life, and put that into you know, 200 odd pages with lots of pictures. That's awesome. Yeah. It took you a while, huh? It, I mean, I remember you took a picture of like being at the publishing house or something like that. Was that oh, a year cool, ago? man! That was yeah, it was a year ago. We okay. went fast on it, I think, actually, awesome. from what from what people. Uh, about. Yeah, I was yeah. expecting for it to be a long, and the publishers pushed it up as well um, to December because they want it to be like the new and was it New Year, New You or whatever. Sure. Um, but yeah, we went fast, and 
yeah, I worked with uh, a good friend, Phil White, as well, mm. on it, who he's like co-written with Dr. Kelly Starrett, who did the Ford for it, okay. um, and like Laird Hamilton and all sorts. He did uh, Brian McKenzie and Andy Galpin's nice. Unplugged book. Um, so we collaborated together on it, and that was Sweet. immensely helpful for extra research and just like a, a buddy to get yeah. psyched on. Who's done it before to help you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that was amazing. And then my editor was like, everybody on the team to do it was awesome, which I'm so like cool. so immensely grateful because I've heard a lot of horror stories from authors. Yeah. And I've so far every step of the way, it's just been like, it's been a, a very cool kind of tribal experience putting it together. That's so awesome. How did you get into a flow state? Like, what did you have a set of rituals? You're like, okay, this is what I do before I write? Or would you just... Yeah, kind of, sort of. Yeah. Um, tea has been huge, mm -hmm. like pretty dependent on tea. Hot, warm, you know, warm beverage, which is also tea, a fun thing for people, is if you are having a meeting with somebody, it's in your favor to get them a cup of coffee or hot tea or something like that. Because uh, when we're holding a warm beverage, we'll start to perceive people as being like more warm and open and all that right. stuff. And yeah. we're holding a cold beverage, then it will kind of close up a little bit and right. perceive people as being like shorter and cold and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Anyway, so I would do a lot of hot tea and just consistency. You know, so around like nighttime was the time that I was the most effective. Mm. Um, you know, so essentially like eight o'clock to like 11 o'clock was like my window. If mm. the sun's down, I can be a lot more creative. If, if, if the lights, if lights out, um, it's easier for me to be more like executive go um, or just go play. Yeah. Uh, but once the sun goes down, um, I have, there's more, I don't feel like I need to do anything anymore. So yeah, really you can helpful. sit down and focus and everything like that. Yeah, you know, I've read a study that if you shake someone, that people perceive someone, if they sh if you shake their hand and their skin is cold, mm -hmm. that you think they're, they're cold or like, yeah, they're like, yeah, off. Yeah, warm yourself up. It's pretty interesting. Stay warm. Yeah, I mean, it's just so much integration with it. And so think of that. So we're always gathering, you know, millions of bits of information. So that's just one subtle little thing. Like, hey, I shake the hand, their skin's cold. I'm like, oh, it's kind of like a weird, cold, kind of disconnected. Like, I don't know about this person. That's one little bit of information that you gather. Think about what you gather from, you know, eye contact. Think of what you gather from the posture of that person. Think of what you gather from the tonality of their voice the pacing of their language. They talk really fast, kind of like I am right now, because yeah. I'm trying to pack Squeeze in some information, in. Yeah, yeah. you know, but nonetheless, the influence that me packing that in, it might not actually be at the service of listeners because I might be winding them up. You know, so it may have been better in this last five minute segment had I slowed down and said less. You know, that's so that's you're always gathering information from each other. Totally. It just and the more that you can learn that, the more I think interesting life becomes. And now all of a sudden, airports become this amazing opportunity for you to people watch, oh, as opposed to just being, wow, this sucks. Yeah, I'm just trapped here. It's trapped. It's yeah. damn airport. It is pretty funny, and people are glued to their phones mostly. I get it. And so within that, it's a great opportunity for a person, you know, you, me, the listener, whatever. Uh, to be kind of being a revolutionary, put yeah. your damn phone down. Yeah, I think mean, we, we kind of shut down, you know, our intuition and our feelings, and we override them with, we we just ignore them or whatever. But um, or we just don't have language for them. Yeah. You know, so some, sometimes it's very helpful to have some basic mechanical breakdown or description of some of those things, so that you can kind of shine the light on them for a moment, and then from there you get enough momentum to start paying attention. You know, so in communication, you know, starting to pay attention to all those little subtleties that are coming from the other person or yourself. Yeah. Um, in your home, start paying attention to, okay, if I, as I walk into this home, what shape does it form the humans that inhabit this space? You know, so, okay, if I have a dinner table and then I have a couch and then I have a TV, then I have like, okay, that's essentially it. It's all packed in there. Um, what's the shape of the people in that space? You know, compared to if you go to into place and it's like, oh, cool, you have a, a pull-up bar and you got a, like a yoga swing and you got, you know, a yoga mat and you got a this comfy rug that you just want to lay down on and like roll around on. Yeah. You know, like okay, and you have you have colorful paintings on the wall or something like that. You have a chalkboard that you can like write quotes or you know draw a picture because you're just feeling creative. Oh, you have instruments, great. You have a guitar. Oh, you have a flute. You know, you walk into that room. What's the shape of that person? Yeah. Like you can absolutely know 100% what the shape of that person is. Right. Maybe not 100%, but pretty high percentage. Got a good you idea. could guess. Yeah. Yeah, structure equals function, right? And yeah, that makes yeah, sense. That's, right. that's awesome. 
Um, so if people want to connect with you, it's Align Podcast. Is that the main website? Everything's Align Podcast, yeah. So yeah. they can go, um, you know, so they can listen to the Align Podcast or Instagram's Align Podcast. Mm-hmm. And then uh, to grab the book, thealignbook.com. Or it's yeah. on, you know, Amazon. Just type the Align Method in. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Um, so if people are new to your podcast, what's one episode that like, oh, they got to listen to? This one is oh, like great. your favorite recording. Oh, man. I like... Chris Ryan, who I mentioned, Sex at Dawn guy. I mean, Wim Hof is, is always fun. The last one was good. Neil Strauss, mm-hmm. writer of The Game and oh, Truth yeah. and all that, oh, is good. Um, man, there's so many good ones. I really, really love doing the podcast. Mm-hmm. I love having conversations with people that are different than the other 9,000 podcasts that they've done. Yeah. You know, so getting into kind of different parts of that person and you know having more like organic conversation with them mm-hmm. and exposing different parts that you know sometimes neither the guest or I, you know, knew that we were going to be exposing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I listened to the one with, uh, is it Peter McEwen? Yeah, About culture yeah, in McEwen. Ireland. Yeah, yeah things like that. It was yeah. like, it, it was, it was, yeah. You, you take, you do, do a deep dive, which is awesome. Try to do that. You do yeah. too, man. I really appreciate your work. It's Thank very, you. it's very cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate you doing it. Appreciate you, buddy. Man. This was a great opportunity. Thank you, sir. Hope everyone enjoyed it. Hopefully you guys can still see us. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. Definitely check out Aaron's work over on Instagram and also YouTube as well. And the book and will be linked below in the description.